Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Elizabeth Pruitt. I'm a policy analyst for ACES Connection. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. It's jointly sponsored by ACES Connection and the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, CTIP. Uh, I am sharing the co-moderating function today with Andy Blanche. Uh, she is acting director of CTIP a national organization promoting trauma-informed public policy. Uh, Andy is an independent uh, consultant. She has been working locally and uh, statewide on trauma-informed initiatives around the country, and she's a nationally known expert on both trauma and mental health issues. Um, I'm uh, not sure that the uh, the record the the webinar is being recorded, so um, I'll pause for just a moment and make sure that that's happening uh, before we go any further. Thank you. We'll be right back with you. Okay. Um, so today we're very honored to have Laura Porter uh, presenting on the self-healing communities model. Uh, this webinar is the second in a series of state-to-state -state, uh, sharings of best practices. Uh, the first featured the Alaska's, uh, Alaska's new law to direct uh, state, uh, the state to incorporate the principles of early childhood and youth brain development into state policy. Uh, first, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, please enter your questions into uh, the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And it's important for you to ask questions as we go along because we'll have a couple of uh, breaks uh, in the, uh, the presentation, the formal presentation to answer your questions. Uh, the link to the recording uh, will be sent out along with the slides to all of the registrants, and it will also be archived on acesconnection.com on the homepage in the web webinar section. Um, our featured speaker today, um, many of you are very familiar with her work, so let me just suffice to say that Laura Porter is one of the most eloquent and important voices in the ACES trauma-informed and resilience building um, movement that so many of us are involved in now. Along with uh, Dr. Rob Anda, uh, who was the co-author of the original case stu uh, a study with Dr. Vincent Filetti, uh, uh, Laura Porter is also the co-founder co of ACE uh, Interface. Um, uh, she is the author of the brief on this uh, subject, along with Dr. Anda and Dr. Martin. Uh, so I hope you've had a chance to look at that and uh, it'll be a resource for you afterwards. It was uh, commissioned by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. First slide, please. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna say a couple words about ACES Connection. We support communities uh, that are working to heal and prevent trauma and build resilience. Uh, we invite you to join the network. We have now over uh, nearly uh, 30,000 uh, members in our network that are working nationally and locally and statewide uh, to build uh, these trauma-informed organizations and communities. Next slide. And we, uh, we provided our contact information here, so we welcome you to uh, let us know if you have any uh, further questions after the webinar is over and if there's any way that we can support your efforts um, at the, the local level. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Andy now. So hi everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on behalf of the uh, Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. We are an all-volunteer national advocacy organization promoting federal and state policies based on both the science and the practice of trauma-informed approaches. We take a lifespan, cross-sector, public health approach, and we're always trying to hold up the importance of structural change as well as supporting innovative new service approaches. Next slide. Some of our key activities. 
we develop policy briefs, science notes, and other materials to address emerging issues, and you can find them on our website. We host monthly conference calls to update advocates in the field about what's happening on the Hill in terms of trauma-related legislation, and also to promote state-to-state -state sharing. If you have interest in getting involved in that national advocacy network, uh, contact Dan Press. Uh, we partner with other organizations like ACES Connection uh, to uh, produce webinars like today's webinar. And we try to coordinate all of those activities uh, around efforts to influence current policy discussions. So we hope that all of this put together makes a difference uh, in policy efforts. Next slide. Uh, our third partner on today's webinar is the National Center for Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health. The center, under the leadership of Carol Warshaw, has for decades been uh, really in many ways the leading national voice on the intersection of these three issues. And we're really grateful to their support and partnership in, um, in these webinars. So that's it uh, from CTIP. Um, go to our website and join us. And we're gonna turn it over to Laura now for the webinar. Let's see. So thanks for being here. I'm really excited to join all of you. It sounds like there's a lot of you on the line, so we'll look forward to questions. And then uh, when we get done, we'll probably have some questions we couldn't answer. So we'll have a commitment to, um, to making sure we're sorting through and looking for patterns and seeing what else we can provide you that would meet your needs. So I wanted to just start by saying, as we work on reducing trauma and adversity in the population, we're working on really complex issues. We're working on the experience that people have had uh, from their history of their families, the historical trauma, the intergenerational adversity. We're working, we're working on sensitive developmental periods where experience has a really profound effect on human development. And we're also working with the concept of accumulation. And for a lot of people, that concept is challenging. Uh, we also live in a society where in the majority culture, the very same people that experience the most adversity during childhood tend to be the same people who experience the most adversity during adulthood. And we think of this as the progressive nature of adversity. It's not necessary, but there is a tendency in society for that to happen. And of course, we're talking about huge costs, and uh, we have variation in uh, the prevalence of uh, developmental adversity in the population. Communities have <clears throat> vary, uh, some have more, some have less prevalence of childhood adversity. And that map is not a poverty map. Uh, adverse childhood experience and other similar developmental adversities uh, know no bounds in terms of ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic boundaries, uh, they are common in all environments. And we're working with complex systems and we need low cost solutions because we really just don't have enough resource to continue the strategy we've used of uh, chasing after one problem at a time in a sequence and arguing about whose problems are more important than whose. And so, when we developed the self-healing communities model, we reached to the field of system thinking and complexity science uh, to learn more about how natural or living systems actually become powerful forces for healing and well-being. And we turned to that science because we wanted these big, huge shifts in well-being in our communities. We were impatient about incremental change. And we see in complex systems, the driver of those kinds of healing processes is feedback. And here's a really simple idea of feedback. Uh, adversity, as we all know, leads to biologic adaptation. And that adaptation, we go into the world adapted to the experiences we've had in childhood, and then society responds to us. And society's response can either make matters worse, which is the most typical pattern we see in America today, or society's response could make things better, could reduce adversity 
um, as the life course progresses and as generations turn to generations and on and on and on. So we're going to use feedback in order to have a powerful impact on the rates of adversity in the population. Every community is perfectly designed to produce the outcomes, the results that they're producing now. Every community has patterns and a part of our job as leaders is to notice what those patterns are. Uh, I've worked with communities where the pattern was, we're gonna win a grant, we're gonna then fail expectations and the grant funder will pull our money. And that pattern goes on and on and on and funders know that about the community. I've worked in other communities where the pattern is we're going to make committees, we're going to make subcommittees, we'll make subcommittees of the subcommittees. And when that doesn't work, we'll start over making committees. So watch in your community about what are the patterns and begin to think about how you can interrupt those patterns. Everyone is co-creating, co-participating in the patterns. And so the way we interrupt is to think about the values that we're illuminating, the principles we're using, the way we think about the issues and problems, and the structures we create in order to address them. And I'll we'll talk a little more about that. But the good news is that communities are really powerful. Um, uh, Gregory Cajete says that the community is a living spiritual entity supported by every responsible adult. And so we turn to every responsible adult to help us uh, work with all of the resources of community, especially the people resources, to make this big powerful shift. So the self and communities model, it really is about building the capacity of community. We're about investing in the people that have the most uh, at stake, but also investing in the people with the most power to actually prevent high A scores in the next generation. And those are the parenting adults, regardless of their age, if they are currently parenting, they are the people that hold the power to shift the trajectory of health for the next generations and to create the kind of stable nurturing environments that we want for all children. And so we're gonna invest in them to contribute to their core gifts, to help them to experience belonging in the community and to help them understand their own aspirations, their own dreams about what they want for the next generation. We're taking a public health approach to solving these complex and interrelated program problems. And we're doing that by changing people's connections and their shared responsibility and the collective impact of their efforts. So, the self-healing community's partnership principles and process, I'm gonna talk mostly about process today, um, was developed by communities throughout Washington, about 42 communities over more than a decade uh, that uh, tested and fine-tuned um, the processes that I'm gonna talk about today. And they produce stunning results. I'll show you a little bit of those results just as we begin the webinar here. So you get a sense of what I mean by uh, shifting the whole trajectory of the public's health. In each of the graphs I'm gonna show you, the green line represents the trend line for those communities that were using this model, uh, the self-healing communities mo model, the community capacity building model. And the red dotted line is the rest of the state of Washington minus King County, which is where Seattle is. Um, so we see the comparison of those communities that were using the model in green, and those communities that were not in the red dotted lines. And you can see here um, dramatic declines in the rates of juvenile alcohol arrests. And I want to note just quickly, you can see that in the communities using the model, those rates were higher as we started and then lower um, a, a decade later. True for a drug arrests, juvenile arrests for violent crimes coming down and crossing the rates of the rest of the state, juvenile all crime, dropping out of school on a yearly basis and then cohort dropping out, also coming down rapidly, more rapidly than the rest of the state. We saw out of home placements increasing throughout our state during the period, but not increasing as rapidly in the communities that were using this model. And we saw birth to teen moms just plummet in uh, the communities that were using the model, as well as uh, this impressive uh, trend line for child suicide attempts. When we think about these kind of outcomes, what's important to remember is these are changes in the population rates and not just in program participants. And that's what we were designing for as we worked with communities throughout Washington. We wanted to see population improvements. 
In Washington, looking at those 42 communities and the trends they had, we had an economist do an analysis looking at the cost savings. And what we found was a really important factor, and that is we had real-time same biennium cost savings, about $7 for every $1 invested in this system. And then we also had very large long-term savings, about $37 for every dollar. In most prevention initiatives, you only have those long-term savings, whereas this model produced both, uh, starting in about the sixth year. We also saw a lower than projected uh, percentage of people aging into adulthood with uh, higher ACE scores. You see on the left, uh, the communities who were not using the model, in the center, two bars, communities using the model, but not as consistently. And then the communities uh, that we called thriving, uh, where we had consistently high scores in using the model for over um, a, do a dozen years, lower than uh, projected ACE scores, which we feel will change the trajectory of health for that next generation. So in the model, there's a framework for action. That's what I'm gonna talk about next after I take a few questions. That framework is to tell everyone about how experience shapes development um, and to enlist everyone who wants to help in co-creating the kind of culture in a community where uh, we see changes in belonging and uh, hope and other factors, uh, and also an increase in people understanding uh, how to read behavior, how to know what's helping and what's hurting. Um, the second factor is to focus on the dynamics that are sustaining the problems, to understand those patterns in the community, that we use learning to fuel innovation and have iterative cycles of learning, and then we're gonna foster a results orientation. We're gonna periodically take some formal time to really reflect and figure out, reorient ourselves to the future that we all really want and notice what the gap is and think about what are the next strategies we wanna pursue. So this forms a framework for action that I'll talk about next, but first we wanted to take a couple minutes just to think about your questions. So I think Andy's gonna um, see if there's a couple we could address. Sure. The first question that came in is pretty straightforward. When was the model implemented? Uh, the legislation that authorized our work was 94, but the communities didn't really begin their work. They did planning and that sort of thing until 97 and 98. 1994. So you really were early in, uh, <laughs> in looking at these issues. Um, so that's the only question that has come in, but okay. uh, I would ask a question, and I'm, I'm okay. really fascinated by this uh, concept of community patterns and uh -huh. the need to interrupt um, patterns of behavior that a community may even be unaware of, that that's how they mm -hmm. always do business. I'm wondering if you could um, give us an example. You talked about using values and principles and creating structures to help interrupt those patterns. If you could maybe just give us an example of um, of a community that you worked in, what was their pattern? How did you help people come to recognize that that was their pattern? And then how did you help them uh, change it? Well, as a, as a third party, as an outsider, when you join a community coalition for a few meetings in a row, um, one, of the, one of the tasks, I believe, is to ask that question. And oftentimes people will just blurt out the answer. They aren't conscious that they know, but they often do know. Uh, and so that can open up a different conversation. Um, in one community where we were working, a community where we saw that issue of they could successfully win grants, uh, but they tended to have those grants taken away. And so that reinforced the community identity of we can just never do things well enough for the funders. or um, that resentful sense of funders want something from us that's not right for us, and so we just can't get along with funders. And in that instance, I was a funder. Uh, I provided some funding to that community, and so I literally went on site and said, hey, I've talked to other grantors that have given you money in the past, and this looks like the pattern. And they said, yeah, that's it. And I said, well, then I will refuse to take away your grant. That's not an option. So then how will we work together? 
if that can't be an option. So intentionally just looking for ways to change the pattern by refusing to participate in whatever your role is in it. Just calling it out, it sounds like, yeah. is the beginning yeah. of an intervention. Absolutely. So, th thank you. And a whole bunch more questions have now come in. I think okay. we opened the floodgate. Uh -huh. So um, yeah. is there a list of the communities in which uh, you've worked available somewhere? Uh, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, when the state of Washington shifted funding for this work, they took down the website that included all of that information. Um, Andy, why don't I work with you to try to get you an article that has that list in it. We published articles throughout the 17 years I worked for the state, um, but those are not up on the website any place. So. <laughs> That Sorry. would be great, Laura, and I will commit to yeah. working with you on that. Yeah. Um, another question that came in, uh, what are the demographics in the counties that you worked in? Are they generally homogeneous or um, do they include a lot of diversity? Uh, it was a wide range. Uh, Washington is not known to be the most diverse state in the country, uh, but uh, we had a lot of success, for example, in Pierce uh, County where uh, it's the second largest population of a state, has quite a diverse population. Some of the school districts there have dozens of languages spoken, um, all the way to, you know, uh, our very rural or frontier counties where they tend not to be so diverse. In that uh, group of communities we called thriving that consistently had high scores using this model, we had 1.2 million people living, included very diverse communities and, um, and communities that don't have as much diversity. Okay. Um, so I think should we, we go have, to the next section? Are we ready to move on? I think for time we probably okay. are, but we'll come back to questions really soon. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the model. Um, as you read the article, you'll notice uh, that the, there are three elements that we talk about with the model. One is the nature of partnership, uh, that the professional partners are, operate in support of developing the leadership of local people, um, and they operate uh, with an awareness of this complex system science. So I'm not gonna focus on that in this webinar. Um, the second is process, and I am gonna focus there, and the third is principles. I'll mention principles at the end, but in an hour, I thought maybe I should just focus on one of these. So I'm gonna focus on process here, um, which I just described as the framework for action. So this is a diagram of the process. And let me just say that when you're working with people who have experienced a lot of adversity and trauma in their lives, most of us know that anticipatory guidance is really helpful to that group of people. In fact, probably for all of us. We kind of like to know um, just simply what I just did to tell you I'm going to focus on the process here and not on the principles or um, the, the partnerships. Just giving people an advance notice of what we're going to do next reduces anxiety and helps them participate. And we know from our work that anticipatory guidance is really a key in trauma-informed work. And yet our communities at the community level tend to schedule things pretty randomly. We'll think of a new initiative and we'll launch it and we'll have a series of meetings and then we say go and then we expect everybody to know how to participate with that but it has its own unique um, timeline. So instead of doing it that way, we decided to promote this idea of there being essentially seasons of work, uh, and those seasons of work would become predictable to the community, so that if some group of people weren't able to participate in the community's capacity building for three or four years, they knew that in the fifth year they could join and they knew what time of the year the community would be doing certain things. So if we think of these four phases in terms of seasons, um, that's probably the right way to think of this. Uh, this notion that we're gonna focus, we're gonna learn together, we're gonna reflect and think about results, and then we're gonna invite more people to join us. And this cycle has, is powerful because success in one phase leads to success in the next and will uh, reinforce uh, this four phase cycle on its own once it gets started. And you can see that there are two sections here. One section is about appreciative action, and the other section is about allowing what wants to emerge in the community um, to emerge and noticing it and complementing it and bringing it forth. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those two things in these, um, 
in these four phases of work. So the first phase, two phases I'm going to talk about are about appreciative action. And what I mean about that is we're going to use very positive and appreciative and participatory methods um, to learn what's generating the patterns that we're experiencing in the community, the perceptions we're experiencing. We want to use those methods to understand the dreams of people in the community. What do they really aspire to? And at first, those dreams might seem like they're not very grandiose. But the important thing is people need to know their dreams are worthy of the community's action. And so we're servicing them in order to take action. We're also using these methods to learn what works for whom and in what context, because the strategies we use might need to look different neighborhood to neighborhood. And so we need a system that helps us do that learning and facilitate learning um, processes so that we have continuous improvement. So there are two phases in this appreciative action work. The first one we call focus. And what we mean is not like narrowing the focus or choosing the highest priority. What we really mean is like the focus on a camera where we're beginning to see clearly what is driving the status quo. Um, what is our shared perception, our shared understanding of how we've gotten into in most communities kind of a corner that we're in with higher and higher A scores generation by generation, with higher and higher problems concentrated only in some neighborhoods, et cetera. And when we talk about um, these issues, we begin to surface a strategic framework for that conversation, a common language. In many communities, we're starting to use uh, the language of ACEs, uh, uh, community resilience, uh, healing, uh, but we want to be listening to the community and understanding what helps people to focus and understand those dynamics more clearly. And the other thing we're trying to learn about is, is there a rational or cohesive body of work that wants to emerge here? And can we see it clearly? Can we focus on it? So this is a time where we're trying to host dialogues and see clearly the dynamics in the community. So I've listed here, these slides will stay up in the recorded webinar. I've listed here just some of the practical kinds of things we might do if we're um, engaged in this phase. Um, and uh, so I'll just call out a couple of these. Um, Number four, conducting key informant interviews and then using qualitative analysis to understand and get um, the themes in that information. That can be really important work. It's often work that's done by a very small team. They're not necessarily a decision-making team, but that team commits to see the patterns that are emerging out of those interviews and surface new tools. Um, some of the tools I've seen that are valuable to communities. Usually there's a, I would call it a tacit theory of change, an unstated theory of change that's operating and driving uh, the status quo in the community. And so sometimes through interviewing and analysis, you can surface what that unstated theory of change is so that you can name it and talk about it in the community and say, is this what we really believe? One of the most common parts of the tacit theories of change right now um, and continuing is if we just had enough good quality slash trauma-informed services, then we would be okay. And that may not be enough. We may actually need the residents of the community to interact differently with one another on a moment-by-moment -moment and day-by-day -day basis in addition to having a strong service network. So this notion of doing activities that help the surface these, um, the, the drivers of the status quo, which include the tacit kinds of unstated uh, theories and mental models that are operating can be really, really helpful. I also just want to mention that I feel like in a lot of the work across the country, um, communities have lost track of the going door to door part of the work, the seeing people where they are in their workplaces, in their homes, um, in places that are safe for them. We've turned to doing work as if all of this work can be done around a table with meetings, and that's simply not true. We have to interact with people in their everyday lives. So during this phase, we would do more of that kind of work. And after this phase, we would enter a phase, and it will naturally occur, 
uh, where we're really investing in learning together. We might be gaining more knowledge as individuals, but we're also setting up the systems in organizations where we can see programs and practices continually improving based on the feedback that they're getting from customers of those services. And I've given you a list because lots of people say, gee, I just don't know what to do. Um, so I gave you a list of seven examples of things that people do during this kind of learning phase. Um, and uh, sometimes we see parent cafes coming um, into um, this, this community in powerful ways because that allows us to both uh, engage dialogue with parents so that they're learning new information and they can have more dialogue, but also that the formal systems can be learning from the parents. And parents have the most power, so we need to be learning from them. What is the help that actually helps them? Oftentimes we don't actually know the answer to that. We're just using uh, articles and sometimes uh, hearsay <laughs> instead of actually engaging in dialogue with parents to learn uh, what they feel, uh, what their hopes and dreams are, what they feel is the help that would really help. We've also seen communities um, train those employees that do relationship-based services to use a particular kind of interviewing that's common in anthropology. It's basically content-free content interviewing. It's called emic interviewing. And so we're getting the actual language and perceptions of family members back into the system um, using qualitative analysis. So with that, um, I, that's the two phases that are in the appreciative action section, and we move to the emergence section. Emergence is a really interesting concept. It's true in all natural systems that, um, that what happens is um, networks and new kinds of happenings um, begin to get connected to each other, and all at once a shift occurs and a new phenomenon, the emergence of a new way of being, in this case we're after a new cultural reality, um, emerges that can't be explained by its parts. And if you want to read about emergence, you might want to um, Google Meg Wheatley's article. She has a great one on how emergence works in um, human systems and also in natural systems. So our job is to notice what wants to emerge and to use positive gossip. Uh, to promote it. And so we're looking for new lines of communication, new peer support systems, new networks um, that might augment the formal service delivery system. Our noticing and our talking about these is what helps them to emerge in the community. In this quantum world that we live in, uh, noticing matters. And so what we illuminate, what we notice, what we use positive uh, gossip about really matters. So the first phase here is results, and I'm going to just walk you through this fairly rapidly, and then I'm going to open up a few more questions. In this phase, we're really stepping back to say, you know, are we doing the work right? And a lot of organizations already ask that question. The question we often aren't asking is, are we even doing the right work? Um, do we need to move to two generation strategies? Do we need to do neighborhood based strategies? Do we need to integrate social network building into the work that we're doing? Are we monitoring a wide enough set of monitors that we would have a sense of what the intended consequences are, which often our funders require us to watch for? But are we watching enough uh, data to really get a sense of what the unintended consequences are? Uh, and those things are really important, and it's important to set up um, a time when we're reflecting on that, when it's safe to examine it, um, and here's some things we might do in that phase. So we might host more dialogue that are about really talking about the gap between what's happening now and what our dreams are. Um, we might want to really foster hope, and hope has three parts. We have to be able to imagine that there could be a better future, we have to be imagined there could be a path to it, and I could be on the path. So when we're fostering hope-filled action, we're reflecting on what are the things that people are saying that would help them know there is a path to a better future and they could be on the path. What I've noticed is communities often use data to describe and to prove 
um, but I don't really believe in that. I think we have to use data to learn and to engage and motivate. And I think data that's used just to prove whether things are good or bad for program participants just don't give us enough information to fuel the self-healing community process so that we get uh, a natural living healing happening in every neighborhood in our communities. To do that, I think we need to set up three tiers of groups. So I'll just briefly and then let you ask questions. We have to have the groups most communities already have. Those are the groups that talk about individual customers or groups of customers and work together. Um, those are the groups that work on wraparound and those kinds of strategies. We have to have groups that talk about two-year or even five-year planning horizons. What are we gonna do? Those tend to be the collective impact kinds of groups, groups that are working on action plans. The groups we tend not to have in communities are the groups that are not decision-making groups, they're facilitative, and they're thinking about a 10 or 20 year horizon. And they're saying, what are the conversations that if we had them now would position us to do even better in the next decade? What are the tools we could create right now so that the dialogues we had in a few years were successful? What do we do with the interview material so that we have a deeper understanding and we can share it with others? That group in the article, I talk about a meta leadership group and it's often missing in communities. It can just be a huddle team. It doesn't have to be a formal group where people are assigned. It tends to be just a particular kind of personality that loves that work. So let's take a couple more questions and see um, where we are with this. Okay, Laura, going back to um, the very beginning, uh, one participant asked why the data ended in 2004, and do you have any more recent data that you could have shown us? Um, we, um, I've run the numbers on a few communities up to the most recent data available in Washington, which is probably 2015 at this point, 2016 at the most. With, in most states, there's a two or three year lag in this kind of archival data. Um, so this data ended um, at the point when you see because the state of Washington um, decided to zero fund the uh, state office, the hub, um, and that was the office that actually compiled that data. And so now you'd have to go to the individual communities to see if they're monitoring. Okay. For some of my public speaking, I have updated data for a few communities where I tell their stories with, with their permission so that people can see the updated data. We're continuing to see those declines in the high capacity communities. Okay, uh, another question on the, on the data. Do you use the collective impact model in your evaluation and how did you select the performance measures? Uh, the collective impact model promotes having a small subset of performance measures, nine is the magic number. Uh, we monitored, uh, regularly monitored 25 to 30 uh, different data points because we were scanning the horizon on general population well-being. We were looking at health, safety, belonging, well-being, and then once we understood about the ACE study, we were monitoring indicators of all 10 uh, of the ACE categories. And we did that so that we could monitor uh, for um, unintended consequences as much as we were monitoring for intended consequences. So sometimes you'll do a great job, for example, reducing opioid prescription, but your heroin use is going up. Hmm. You have to monitor a wide enough range uh, to be able to see those unintended consequences so that you can make sure that general well-being is actually improved, not just one data point. Okay. Um, jumping uh, forward in your presentation, a couple of people have uh, asked for some clarification um, of the difference between community patterns that you were talking about and community norms, um, a uh, community norm, something like tolerating underage drinking. Uh, can you just mm -hmm. clarify that distinction? So the patterns are at sort of a, a meta level. Um, it's more the pattern of how we interact with our strategies. Do we put in place strategies and then we stick with them forever or do we change them out on a regular basis? So the community norms are more day-to-day um, -day patterns in the interaction of individuals. And uh, these patterns I'm talking about are more system 
interaction with. So Andy got muted because her phone's ringing. So let's see if we can. Un <laughs> <I still, laughs> okay. Thank you. She's That's unmuted. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no problem. Uh, staying with take the, one more. With, yeah, staying with the community norm um, issue, uh, somebody asked uh, if you could suggest an intervention for a school district that, that has a community norm or a cultural belief in authoritative leadership and authoritative parenting style that doesn't um, comport with uh, recognition of the impact of trauma and ACEs. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm a hobbyist in um, systems thinking, complexity theory, and understanding how you get big shifts in very complex systems. And as a part of um, that learning, I've looked at um, uh, Everett Rogers' work on how innovation actually occurs over time. And that includes the innovation of uh, use of equipment, but it also includes thought innovation. And what Rogers found was only about two and a half percent of us are early um, adopters, Rob Anda, Vince Folletti, I'm sure in that camp. Uh, and then another 13 and a half percent of us are um, also willing to go and step out in front and do things that um, are not the, have not been the norm in the past. Um, what he found was that once those people are engaged, they really only have to get the next 33% of the population engaged, and then everyone else will follow. So my philosophy is uh, engage the parents, engage the neighborhoods, engage the public. It's one reason we promote teaching everyone about near science, neuroscience, epigenetics, ACEs, and resilient communities, because we feel that what will happen is that next 33% of the population will get excited. They're the early majority. And it's amazing how those people that were blocking before just turn around and it becomes their idea. So my strategy <laughs> is I would go to the neighborhoods. I would, ha I would foster uh, parent cafes. I would have more discussion about hope and about how experience shapes human development and what parents want for their children. I used to count it as a really good sign. I'd be sitting in my office in the state capitol and I'd get a call from a superintendent at a school district in rural Washington saying, I don't know what you're doing, but you could call these people off because we can't do everything they're asking. And I would say, well, I don't know what they're asking. Talk to me about it. And when that superintendent could articulate the pressure she was getting or he was getting from his community, I would say, yes, yeah, we've done a great job teaching about how Human development is shaped by experience. And it's in a democracy, the power is in the hands of the people. <laughs> so I would orchestrate the pressure coming in the back door um, from the people who are actually using those educational services. That's great. I think we probably have to move to the next move slide. On. I want yep. to just introduce the, the last um, and, and really probably most important, although you have to be doing this cycle in its whole in order to, to get the outcomes that I just showed you at the beginning of the webinar. But I will say that our, really our primary task in the communities is to expand leadership. So the example I just gave you is an example of expanding leadership to include uh, the residents of a neighborhood. Uh, and when I say leadership, I believe that everybody who wants to help in any way is a leader. And so what we're doing is expanding the opportunities for people to help. Um, I was just at a talk by Sean Ginwright. If you don't know his work, you might want to look him up. He's awesome researcher, Sean Ginwright. And he was saying, we want to flood communities with opportunity to heal. And uh, we know from public surveys that people don't actually want to ask for help. They want to give help. And in giving help, we experience healing. So our job is to expand that opportunity for people to give help, uh, to give leadership to their community. So this is uh, the next phase in the emergence part of the cycle that we're including all sectors, all classes, all culture groups. But I want to say that we did learn that you don't need to pull them all together in one place. Oftentimes we have cultural groups that are operating in parallel. What we need to be developing is some common language and some common understanding and some positive gossip that we can shift back and forth among those groups 
we don't need to force the coming together of community. We just need to support the emerging leadership of the community. So we're cultivating new leaders. We're helping them build the kinds of civic skills that will allow them to have success. And I think that's not talked about enough, that we just expect residents of a community to come into um, a healing process and have the skills already. And that's just simply not true. Most people don't. And so uh, we need to scaffold the skill building so that we are supporting people as they give their time and energy and leadership. One of the ways we do that is we strengthen the social networks in the community. We're building conversations that matter. We're promoting social network uh, expansion by hosting dialogue and conversation. And as we do that, people will naturally group and feel a sense of belonging with one another. And then um, they will uh, have more opportunity just because they simply know each other. So here are some of the things we do in the leadership expansion phase of this. Um, in the volunteer management field, most of you, many of you on the line, maybe hundreds of you on the line have worked in the volunteer management field. The most important thing you can ever do is personally invite. Uh, and that's often missing. I'm working in a community right now where there's been a tendency to just put posters up and expect that po posters is an equal invitation. It, it's simply not. Uh, when you say to a person, I know you and you make the best cookies ever. Could you possibly bring cookies once a month? Because that will get people excited about coming to my meeting. It, it could be anything that simple all the way to, I know you and you're a natural leader in my faith community. I need you to speak out about the importance of health and safety and learning about adverse childhood experience. That direct invitation is so important. And I also think enlisting others to be the inviters and teaching those skills to them so that they can then interview their friends and residents and learn about their gifts and become um, um, agents of invitation in the community. You can ask for really out of the box kinds of help. I know um, when I've run campaigns in my own local community, which I haven't done for a number of years, but when I did, I used to just keep a, a quarter sheet of paper that had a whole list of fun things that people might like to do. And I would hand them out when I was at a meeting and say, if you want to do something to help, can you please check the box of everything you like to do, put your name and your email, and then I'll get back to you. That allowed me to know who I should invite to do music at an event who I might invite to help set up chairs, uh, who could do maintenance. And so keeping track of those things that people want to give, so we're inviting um, them to give the very things they want to give. And those of you who know um, my, my current speaking routine when I'm working with a smallest group, I'll have people write for four minutes about what they want to give, and then I'll give that report back to the host of the organization so that the organization that's hosting knows how to invite new leadership. They know what people want to give. So I just want to say a couple things about culture, and we'll take a couple more questions. I don't believe that direct service programs can actually solve these kind of really widespread complex problems that have their root in the way we live with one another day by day. I think we have to focus our efforts on improving the service system and improving the cultural realities of that day-to-day -day living. And culture is really the abstract and learned and shared standards uh, that we use to interpret experience. And culture helps us adapt to our environments. It also helps us know how to behave. And so when we're orchestrating a cultural change process, and I don't mean ethnicity here, I mean just the way we live with one another day, the patterns we use, the ways of interaction that give us comfort, uh, most of that are happening on autopilot. But we can actually take that off of autopilot and consciously be talking about what is it we need to change? Where is the locus of safety? for a child? And how do we interact with the, those people, the caregivers, the parenting adults for that child? How do we interact with them differently so they get the support they need to protect their children from high A scores? 
what I want to just say is that we're creating that culture and that culture change all the time. But as we learn about culture change or any kind of major transition in a complex system, in order to go from a stable, steady state to a whole new way of being with one another, we will go from a comfort with the way things are through a lot of discomfort, and we have to be ready to weather that storm to the new way which will become comfortable again. So maybe in another webinar or another conversation, we can talk about how do you manage the pushback as you're moving through that discomfort zone, which is a natural part of how communities change. So as we think about building communities, uh, healing communities, I want to just underscore that the people with the most power for generating self-healing in a community are the people who have been affected by adversity during development. They have the most power to create the conditions for lower adversity in the next generation. And our job as professionals is to support their leadership, to engage their leadership, to invite their leadership. And as we do that, um, we can implement six principles. I just put these up here and invite you to read the self Healing Communities article to learn more about them. Uh, we've talked about some of them today. Um, near informed engagement, uh, that, will, that will require us to teach everyone about this science of how experience shapes development. And that's one of the reasons Rob and I promote uh, training of trainers so that you can really saturate the community with that knowledge. And in the end, what we are doing here is helping people surface their core values, the principles, what they truly appreciate about one another. We've developed a cultural habit of noticing what bothers us, but actually we can also shift that habit and notice and hold visible um, our love for one another and use positive gossip, use invitation, use social network building um, to remind people about how precious every human being is and how we hold that fundamental um, respect for the wisdom in people. So just illuminating that will remind people of uh, a value they already hold. So we have just a few more minutes maybe for questions. I don't know if Andy wants to surface any. I have lots here. Uh, can you, <laughs> can, a lot you of people on the line. can you share some lessons learned uh, about messaging for parents and residents? And then I would add to that: Were you able to integrate some of what you learned in the Emic interviewing into your messaging? Yes, absolutely. We created feedback loops um, at a couple different levels, both through Emic interviewing with parents and customers of services, but also through key informant interviewing of Rotary members, et cetera. And we would use those feedback to be improving our messaging. Um, we, we learned uh, that the framing of these issues is, is vital. Um, we stopped talking about adversity um, in terms of um, having negative effects. We started talking about really the truth, which is that adversity creates adaptation. So those adaptation bring us strengths as well as sometimes risks. And um, so talking about adaptation and helping people locate the strengths that maybe came from the experience in their lives is really, really important. Another um, key thing we found was as we're thinking about um, healing and well-being, to not limit ourselves to this notion of resilience. Um, Certainly it's great uh, that people have the capabilities and that sense of belonging and the community surrounding them that help them bounce forward into really functional lives, which is what I think of resilience. But it's also important uh, that we're healing, that we're generating the kind of cultural uh, reality that will mean less adversity for the next generation. Uh, so those are two keys. Uh, but messaging is a really fun topic. We probably could have a whole amazing dialogue about it. <laughs> uh, we also did a process in Washington. It was a two-year process where we were asking the people of Washington, what is a thriving family? And so we created a framework of outcomes that, that the people of Washington uh, could agree were 
um, they would want for every family in our state. So we were able to use that information then to promote um, activities in every county. Uh, so I seem to have lost the, the visual here, but can you still hear oh, me, Laura? Um, I can hear you. So uh, it, a last question, if we have time. Um, can, this two minutes. Can, can this model be done without funding? What if you have a community huh. that's trying to um, uh, do some work using community volunteers? Um, do you mm -hmm. think that can be done? So what we saw was that many of our communities started out with this process um, and the process itself helped to generate the kind of confidence that allowed them to have funding for maybe a quarter time coordinator of the process. It is really helpful to have at least a part time person whose job is to support people um, in, in these phases. And the reason that I think um, the phases are so important is that your grant sources, uh, your programmatic uh, requirements, those will come and go over time. And you'll be feeling like you're just having this, uh, you're a ping pong ball as a community. You're doing what they say. No, we'll do what they say. No, we'll do what they say. But if the community itself has its own process for learning and improving and expanding leadership, then you can integrate those those um, changing uh, requirements into your community's own process. So it allows you to own your own um, process and that builds efficacy and strength. So the answer is yes, but I wouldn't try to do it for free for very long, <laughs> maybe a couple of years. And then I would look at pooling funds. I mean, we have communities across the country where literally uh, the, the CEOs of nonprofits are putting 2% of uh, their salaries into a pool in order to make sure there's a person dedicated to support them in uh, putting this process into place. So you can find very innovative ways of generating just enough dollars uh, for a part-time position. Fantastic. Um, it is four o'clock, I think. It is. Um, yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to end us on time or should I keep asking questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think we should probably stop now. I feel like uh, this has been an incredibly rich uh, hour and we will look over the questions and in some way uh, p possibly a, another webinar or uh, some way convey that um, find a way. information uh, to you. And I just want to thank um, both my co-moderator, Andy Blanche. That was terrific, terrific job, Andy. And Laura, uh, we are so grateful for what you were able to convey today. All of your experience and um, expertise is so appreciated. And I feel like I learned some very, very, both inspiring things, but also very mm -hmm. concrete steps and that was one of the things we talked about in planning is like people want to know sort of what the steps are and how to do it and I think that was definitely accomplished today. So I want to thank all of the people that are listening today and do get in touch with us and also uh, join ACES Connection if you're not a member and also get involved with CTIP, the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. So we hope to hear Thank from you. you going forward. And thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Laura. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank all of you for dialing in.